Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the Presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of James Garfield, and the focus is the Horatio Alger myth comes true. Horatio Alger was an author. He wrote fiction in the latter portion of the 19th century, and his books all had a very similar theme. They were about young boys who were down in their luck, but maybe they get an education, hard work, perseverance, maybe a little bit of luck along the way as a catalyst to give them an opportunity where they would rise and frankly live the American dream, the true rags to riches story. This was the theme from Horatio Alger, again, who wrote almost entirely fiction until 1881 where he decided to write a real-life book, a real-life biography of a man who lived the Horatio Alger myth. It was called From a Canal Boy to President. This was the book by Horatio Alger, which was the true life story of James Garfield, who lived the Horatio Alger myth. He started out in that one-room log cabin on the, without a father in the, in the territory of the state of uh, Ohio, where he was out on the frontier working for pennies as a canal boy, but eventually gets that education in East Coast College, comes back home, principal of Hiram College, becomes a state legislature, joins the Union Army, leads men in battle, becomes a major general, and then eventually moves to the United States Congress, where he serves as state of Ohio for 17 years before becoming president of the United States. And when Alger gets to that point in the story, he writes, had this been a story of the imagination, such as I have often written, I should have not dared to crown it with such an ending. In view of my hero's humble beginnings, I should expect to have it severely criticized as utterly incredible. But reality is oftentimes stranger than romance, and this is notably illustrated in this wonderful career, the real-life story of James Garfield, if only it had a happy ending. The apex of the career of James Garfield occurred on Inauguration Day, March 4th of 1881. He was actually up late the night before rewriting his inaugural address. He still had some issues with his cabinet that we'll talk about in just a moment. But on that morning, it was snowy, it was cold. He got in his carriage with Rutherford Hayes, the outgoing president. They made it to the Capitol where Chester Arthur, the vice president, first took his inauguration or his oath of office in the Senate chamber. The sun actually broke through. They moved to the east front of the Capitol capital where Garfield took his oath of office. He was surrounded by his family, which included a first. His mother, the first mother to actually witness her son be inaugurated as president, was Eliza Garfield, the woman who had raised him and his brother and his two sisters in that small cabin in the, in the frontier area of Ohio. Eliza Garfield, 80 years old, is there to witness her son be inaugurated as president of the United States. And she said that day, I feel very thankful for such a son. I don't like the word proud. But if I must use it, I think in this case it is quite appropriate and pretty much everybody would agree. Well, Garfield's inaugural was his only policy statement of his entire presidency, which of course was so short, he did touch upon all of the major topics. First of all, put conflicts of the past behind. Let's forget about the Civil War and move forward as a united country. He celebrated the elevation of blacks during that process, in which he said from slavery to the full rights of citizens, that is the most important political change we have known since the adoption of the Constitution of 1787. So far as my authority can lawfully extend, they, blacks, shall enjoy the full and equal protection of the Constitution and the laws. He also promoted in his inaugural the role of the federal government in promoting universal education, something that was near and dear to his heart. He was committed, as he always had been, to a specie-based economy backed in gold. And he was plenty to pick up right where Rutherford Hayes left off in the topic of civil civil service reform. In his inaugural, he said, that I shall at the proper time ask Congress to fix the tenure of the minor offices of the several executive departments and prescribe the grounds upon which removal should be made during the terms for which incumbents have been appointed. There was a celebration that day, a big parade in front of the White House. In fact, Hayes joined Garfield as they watched it go past. And then that night, the inaugural ball. It took place at the new Smithsonian Museum, which hadn't even opened to the public yet. This is the first major event all the way to the top for James Garfield to celebrate at the inaugural ball his rise from the days in Ohio in that one-room log cabin to the presidency of the United States, and it would all go downhill from here.
But they did move into the White House. Garfield and his clan have now five children. The first lady, his mother, also living with them in the White House. That was also a first. Young Irving and Abraham or Abram would ride their bicycles around the, the White House at times. They would interrupt their father whenever they darn well pleased. Daughter Molly went to nearby Madame Burr's school. And a couple of the oldest boys, Harry and Jim, they would soon be off to Garfield's alma mater, Williams, where they would attend college. This was a happy time for the family to come together at the beginning of the administration, and a key decision was in the hands of Lucretia Garfield. Would she or would she not permit alcohol in the White House? Her predecessor's first lady, um, Lucy Hayes, had banned alcohol. Not very popular, particularly with the diplomatic corps. And Lucretia Garfield thought about it. She talked to a couple of people and they said, you know what? Let's bring alcohol back into the White House. And she was she made that decision and many people were very happy. The focus for Garfield initially was indeed about civil service reform because it was abundantly clear from day one that he had a lot of work to do. There were people lined up for as far as the eye could see looking for jobs as he started his presidency. And his challenges in this area actually came before Inauguration Day, where he was working on his cabinet and whom to appoint. And it started with James Blaine. The Secretary of State nod went to Blaine, who was Garfield's uh, former friend and colleague from the House of Representatives, former Speaker of the House, and Blaine got this top spot. Now, Blaine and Roscoe Conkling were estranged. Conkling was the boss from New York who had a bit of a challenge with Garfield during the campaign, but eventually he did support and Garfield won New York by 1%. That was the difference in winning the presidency, and Conkling felt he deserved a top spot in the cabinet as his reward for one of his people. But Garfield went in another direction. After giving Blaine Secretary of State, he filled out the other spots, and all New York got was Postmaster General, the slowest spot on the rung in the cabinet. Well, Conkling was in Infuriated. And again, this is before the inaugural. He grabbed Vice President-elect Chester Arthur. They raced over to Garfield's hotel room. And Garfield sat at the end of his bed, ever so quietly, while he let Conkling berate him for about an hour. Finally, Conkling was out of steam. Garfield stood up, never said a word, walked out of the room, didn't make any changes in his cabinet. He did have to make one change at the very last minute when uh, the Secretary of Treasury nominee actually backed out and he replaced him with William Wyndon, but still no major spots for Conkling in the cabinet, just that minor post for New York. And he still had about 100,000 jobs to hand out. Office seekers were everywhere and Garfield couldn't stand it. He said, almost everyone who comes to me wants something. These people would take my very brain, flesh and blood if they could. My God, what is there in this plate so that a man should ever want to get into it? This is why civil service reform was so needed to try to at least get many of these positions out of this political morass. Well, Garfield still wanted to deal with Roscoe Conkling. He felt a little guilty about the fact that Conkling didn't get a spot in the cabinet that he liked, and Conkling was important in him winning the presidency. So he agreed to a meeting with Conkling on March the 20th, 1881, and Conkling demanded the patronage for five key positions in New York. He wanted Garfield to give them to him so he could make his own decisions, and then Garfield would do the nominations, and Garfield agreed. He agreed that he would give Conkling those five spots. But then that made Made James Blaine upset. And this is a bit of a saga that is just kicking off. Blaine didn't like the fact that Garfield, or that rather Conkling, was going to get these spots, and he concocted a scheme basically to get Conkling. And this centered on the key position in New York, which was the collector of the Custom House, the most lucrative political patronage position of all. Well, Conkling didn't actually initially ask about this position because he already had his guy. Edwin Merritt was in that position. He had two years to go, and so he was focusing on other positions. But Blaine's scheme went right after the collector's spot. Here's how it was going to work. Blaine suggested putting his guy, William Robertson, immediately into the position of collector of the Custom House in New York. What would he do with Merritt? He would move him to London as Consul General. What would he do with Adam Badeau, who was already in that spot, and Badeau being a very close intimate of Ulysses Grant? Well, we'll just move him as well. We'll move him to be the Minister of Denmark. Minister of Denmark? Well, what would we do with Michael Kramer? He was in that job. Well, we'll move him to make him a minister in Switzerland. All of this from Blaine just to get his way with Rosto Roscoe Conkling. So what did Garfield do? 
He went along. On March the 23rd, just a couple of days after he had met with Conkling, he sent all of these changes to the Senate, didn't consult with anyone, and not surprisingly, there was an explosion. Conkling leading the charge, calling it perfidy without parallel, and he vowed revenge. Ulysses Grant broke with Garfield over this after what he did to, to Adam Badeau. According to, Gar to Grant, I ought not to be humiliated. Garfield has shown that he is not possessed to the backbone of an angle worm. The implication is that James Blaine is really running the show, not President Garfield. Well, the saga continued, and believe it or not, Garfield agreed to meet with Roscoe Conkling, and Conkling was going to come over, and they were going to talk it out one evening at the White House. But just like he did during the campaign, Conkling stiffed Garfield. He didn't show. In fact, he waited an hour and a half before he sent word that he wasn't coming, and this made Garfield incredibly upset. He was fuming over this insult, and at this point, he dug in. He said that it had better be known in the outset whether the president is the head of the government or the registering clerk of the Senate. Robertson may be carried out of the Senate head first or feet first, but I shall never withdraw him. He was going forward with that nomination, and Conkling was vowing to fight it in the Senate. His goal was to rally the Republicans to defeat that nomination, senatorial courtesy, their livelihood was at risk, and he was going to dig in. But there were changes afoot in the Senate. Conkling had offended a lot of people over the years, including some of his fellow Republicans. The Democrats were all against him. And with a few Republicans on board to go against Conkling and support Garfield, Robertson was actually confirmed for the position of collector. This was a major triumph in the, in the wars about patronage for James Garfield. But then the oddest thing happened next. Thomas Platt, who was the other senator from New York, came up with an idea on how to embarrass the president. What would he do? Platt and Conkling would resign their positions in the Senate to stand down. And why would they do this? Because then they would go back to New York, the state legislature in New York would re-elect them to the Senate, and this somehow would be humiliating to the President of the United States. Well, Conkling decided to go along with it, one of the worst political decisions ever made in the history of the United States Congress. Because the state legislature in New York had also kind of had enough of Conkling, and this was a chance to finally get rid of him. So they debated this for a couple of months, and in the end, Platt and Conkling were out. They were not put back into their jobs. Two other people got those appointments. Roscoe Conkling would never hold political office again. This whole scheme was a monumental failure in the hands of Rof Roscoe Conkling and kind of a nice triumph for James Garfield. But Garfield actually had much bigger concerns at the time and it had nothing to do with politics. He's still only a couple of months into the job as president and his focus is on his wife, Lucretia. She's sick about a malaria, and it's getting serious in early May. Her temperature reaches 104 degrees before she finally starts to improve. Well, Garfield decides to take his wife and his daughter Molly to the Jersey Shore, which is a place they like to vacation. It would be better weather for her there, an opportunity for his wife to recover. Now, he still had some work to do, but his plan was to rejoin them for vacation in about a month and be by her side. He would never arrive. That's the story for another day. That is James Garfield and the Horatio Alger myth comes true from the life of James Garfield. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.